Hi, and welcome to the final lesson of English in the Modern Office. This is lesson two of the presentation unit, and I'm Keith Gillibrand, your lead tutor. By the end of this week, we'll have finished the main body of the course, covering the use of the telephone, emails, meetings, and now presentations. This course should have given you a head start on how to work well in a modern international office. The work we've done so far, and that we will finish this week, should, with a little practice, overcome your fear of public speaking and help you to deliver amazing presentations. So, what are we going to do this week? Well, in part two, we'll show you how to choose the right chart to describe different types of data. Part two will also include an explanation of what the different graphs and charts do. Part three of the lesson will cover how to conclude presentations. And finally, in part four, we'll show you how to deal with questions. So, straight on to part two. It's vital, both in presentations and in general, that we create and use charts to clarify and provide the right visual for analysis. To do this, you should first understand the reasons why you might need a chart. In the introduction, I'll cover five easy questions to ask yourself when choosing the right chart to show data in your presentation. The five easy questions to help you. What are they? Well, question one, do you want to compare values? Charts are really good for comparing one set of values with another. They can easily show you high and low values in the data sets. To create a comparison chart, consider using the following types of graphs. Column, bar, circular area, line, scatter plot, or a bullet chart. More is in the lesson on the use of most of these types of charts. Question two you should ask yourself, do you want to show the composition of something? We might use a chart like this to show how individual parts make up the whole of something, such as phone types used by the people of Taiwan to illustrate quickly and clearly the most popular brands. To show composition, we might use a pie chart, a stacked bar chart, a stacked column chart, an area chart, or a waterfall chart. Again, the main charts to use are covered in the lesson. If you're asking, why am I not showing all the charts to use? Well, there are 13 types of charts and several variations of each. To cover them would take about two hours of video and eight hours for you to study them. Question three, do you want to understand the distribution of your data? Distribution charts help us to understand outliers. That's the biggest and the smallest numbers in our set of data. Maybe the tallest and shortest heights if we're measuring how tall people are in Asia University. We can easily see the normal tendency and the range of information in the values. We might choose any one of the following charts to show distribution. A scatter plot chart, a line chart, a column chart or a bar chart. Question four, are you interested in analyzing the trends of your data set? If you need to know more information about how a data set performed during a specific time period, there are certain chart types that do this extremely well. You could choose from line charts, dual access line charts, or column charts. The fifth and last question, do you need to understand the relationship between value sets? Relationship charts are ideal for showing how one variable relates to one or several different variables. You might use this to show how something positively affects, has negative effects, or even has no effects on other variables. If you're trying to establish the relationship between things, then consider using one of these charts. A scatter plot chart, a bubble chart, or a line chart. Moving on to concluding your presentation. 
The third part of this lesson covers how to conclude your presentation. After all, leaving a good impression means that what comes at the end is usually what's remembered the most, right? Well, maybe. But what we need to make sure of is what we remembered from our presentation is the message that we want to convey, whatever that is. Part three of the lesson covers the use of tautograms and the power of three. But here I want to include a little bit about sometimes how we use famous voices. Using famous voices and slogans. Very often, companies use the voices of well-known personalities to advertise. We, the easily persuaded public, don't quite know who the voice belongs to, but it's familiar. So we feel more at ease and more inclined to believe the message he or she is giving. Some might know Neil Patrick Harris is the overly charming actor trying to talk us into drinking Heineken while Matthew McGonaghy tells us how he's driven a Lincoln long before he was paid to. Channing Tatum famously got his start in show business by appearing in some very funny Mountain Dew commercials. Some of us might watch the Smirnoff ads with Alison Brie and Adam Scott and quietly wish we were hanging out with them like a trio of best friends. It's amazing just how much a celebrity can influence a normal person in a key demographic like me. Notice also that many companies' slogans use the voices of famous people. Think Carlsberg, probably the best lager in the world. Orson Welles from 1975, still used today. Budweiser, this is a famous Budweiser beer. George Clooney, 2005. Duracell, batteries Trusted everywhere. Jeff Bridges, 2012. But wait, I'm getting carried away. English for Advertising is a complete ESP course that's English for specific purposes in itself. But just think, could presentations be made more memorable too just by using a key speaker? Made more memorable. Do you see how I combine the words to make a tautogram, the same time as using the power of three. No, wait, I haven't told you what a tautogram is yet. The tautogram. A tautogram is text which all words start with the same letter. A hundred years ago, tautograms were mainly used in poems, but now we use them to make catchy phrases. They're rather like alliterations, you know where all the words sound similar. The difference between a tautogram and alliteration is that tautograms are written, visual word devices, whereas alliterations are phonetic sounds. Most cases of alliteration are also tautograms, though certainly not all, since different letters can frequently take on the same sound. For example, circle segment, or catch your ken. Similarly, most tautograms are also alliterations, though exceptions exist when using letters that have multiple pronunciations. While we're using crazy big words, what does onomatopoeia mean? Well, that means a word that when spoken sounds like what it means. Words like meow, or honk, or boom. Back to the power of three. The power of three, however, is all around us, thanks largely to the world of advertising. Who hasn't heard of? Just do it. You should now be screaming, Nike, Nike. I'm loving it. Not my favorite, but McDonald's all the same. Vorsprung Dirk Technik. You see it even works in German. Audi cars. The ultimate driving machine, BMW. Every little helps. Now that's Tesco in the UK, and I forgive you for not knowing this one, but the list is endless. An interesting thought crosses my mind here. Do you think that people would be as happy 
about Nike's catchy slogan if they learned it was actually based on a convicted killer's words just before he was executed by firing squad in the USA in 1976? Probably not. Consider this. Is it possible to end your presentation somehow, leaving your audience with just three words? When we close this lesson at the end of the week, I'll attempt to show you how this can be done in the wrap-up. So when concluding your presentation, end with a bang, like the beginning. Remember that it's the last impression that can linger the longest. So think, preparing a strong ending to your presentation is every bit as important as preparing a strong beginning. A strong opener grabs your audience's attention and leads them to the key messages. But a strong close takes them back to your key messages and brings your presentation full circle to your ultimate objective. So, best to plan your conclusion carefully. Your grand finale is a critical part of your presentation. It's the destination that your entire presentation is heading towards. It must bring your presentation around full circle to the object you've been guiding your audience towards. It has to reinforce your key messages. It has to sound like a conclusion, leaving no doubt that it is a conclusion. It has to add a positive impression that hopefully you will have created with your audience. Finally, your conclusion should be short. Don't ramble here. Any ending that drags on usually undoes much of the positive impact of an otherwise great presentation. Once you announce you're about to wind up, don't go on talking. I'm talking. To conclude our lesson on conclusions and quote a famous American cartoonist, that's all, folks. Oh, but wait, I haven't done the bit about now, does anyone have any questions? Like many people doing presentations, I was leaving the questions to the very end. Is this wise? So, what about the questions? The dreaded question and answer session in, of any presentation. Presenters will often seek ways to avoid difficult questions. As if it's, and especially for non-native English speakers, it's going to be very hard. But it doesn't have to be. Dealing with questions in a presentation is a skill which anyone can master. Think about maybe fielding or answering the questions as you go through the presentation. This can be an effective way to ensure questions are relevant. The danger is, by doing this, you lose some of the natural flow of the presentation. That is something you must decide on when you start to plan your presentation. So how do you deal with these questions? Do you want to answer questions right at the end? Where, if they're not dealt with well, then a negative aura might well descend upon your audience. How do you field answer the questions as you go through the presentations? If you prefer to deal with the questions as they arise, and you're worried about the potential loss of flow, let me suggest an easy way for you to do it. During your introduction, explain that there are three types of question, types A, B, and C. There are a lot of questions that are looking for further explanation of something that has just been said. Tell your audience that you'll answer this type of question, type A, immediately. There's also the sort of question that asks about something that's related, something that you plan to cover later. Tell your audience that you will answer those types of questions, type B, later in the presentation. Finally, there's the sort of question that is best dealt with outside the presentation, either because most of the audience won't be interested or because it's outside the topic of the presentation. Tell the person that you'll make a note of the question and come back to the question afterwards. How to deal with nasty questions. There are some basic pointers when answering questions which summarize into. Always answer briefly and to the point. 
try to anticipate your questions. How do we deal with interruptions? And how we reform the question. If you choose to leave your questions to the end, then make sure that when you've finished answering them all, you get the last word, strongly asserting your main message. Thank the audience for their questions, and then summarize once again the main point or points of your presentation that was designed to communicate. Better, in my view, to deal with the questions as per my ABC advice and conclude with the conclusion. OK, an introduction that is a mini lesson in itself, perhaps. Happy studying, students. This, your last week of regular lessons. Next week, a review of the past three weeks plus this week, then your final, your very own presentation.